you do very interesting work. So I'm like, I, I want to get to the Mexican slavery piece because I don't think most, I don't think in North America, we think of slavery beyond much about what other, what we did or what what happened in the islands um, before liberation. And yet they, they, there's a there's a sadness to the story in Mexico that's just as profound as ours. Oh yeah, well you know this, the, it's it's there's there's this curious difference between the two slaveries that the uh, uh, the two systems of slavery the, the Spaniards when they uh, when they conquered when Cortez conquered Mexico they had a very hip attitude toward slavery that they didn't buy slave or slaves from Africa or anything it was they would just enslave the native population and so they they, they when they they conquered uh, Mexico there were approximately there were there were over 30 million um uh, in, indigenous people living in in Mexico and uh, through through um uh, they, a lot of them, they they killed a lot of the Spaniards killed a lot of them inadvertently through the diseases, you know, smallpox, measles, right. whatever. But um, they also in eighteen, in, I'm sorry, in uh, fifteen sixty five, uh, the the, Sp- the Spaniards had a silver strike called El Rufo, and they discovered almost overnight that Mexico was one gigantic mountain of silver. And as soon as as soon as they discovered that. The days were numbered for the, the native population, and they just enslaved them. They had no rights. They just enslaved them promiscuously into the uh, into the, the 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 silver mines, the gold mines, in the different haciendas, and and <clears throat> worked them to death in the fields. And oh, within about less than a hundred years from that moment, the, uh, the the they had reduced the in, indigenous population from over thirty million down to less than a million. And they were in the process of going extinct. And the Catholic Church, which had been relatively cruel in their attitude toward colonization, they actually intervened. And they said, these people that, you know, we may not think much of them, but they've got souls to be saved for Jesus. Therefore, you just, you you know, there was no penalty for kill, killing Indians. And they said, you're not allowed to kill, kill Indians for no reason at all anymore. And you cannot work them to death in your fields and your, uh, and your mines. So that the... Uh, but, at that point, the Spaniards had um, basically raped anything that stood still long enough, and they had a very large mestizo population. But I want to pause that for just a second, and I want to say it was all, I mean, in some ways, between the Aztecs and the Mayans, those were already brutal and sometimes violent societies, but it was nothing compared to about what was going to happen to them when the Spaniards got there. Yeah, during the next 130 years after... Cortez landed. There, there had been approximately 33 million um, indigenous peoples in Mexico, and there were fewer than a, mil- a million left. And that that is, you could imagine what the what the Mexican people were going through during that period. It was going through for they had 130 years of Hiroshima, of the Gulag Archipelago, of the Holocaust. Right. They were um, and and what the uh, the the. You talk about really prolonged, lethal suffering. You know, it was a great die-off. It was like a great extinction event. And that, um, you know, the, the the Mexican people, they have enormous stoicism, enormous uh, fatalism, enormous right. courage, being courage beyond uh, uh, unimaginable courage. And I think a lot of that was uh, was forged during that that period when. When uh, you know, when ninety eight percent of the the population right. died horrible, painful, agonizing deaths. Yeah, I mean, it was a Holocaust of enormous proportions, yeah. and and in a in a fairly, as you said, you mentioned a pretty quick period of time, and that that has a way of um, imprinting on a nation's soul, just like our yeah. own slavery did, which is part of why. Abraham Lincoln and others were trying to abolish it. it they knew it was staining our soul yeah. um, as a country and that we had to eradicate that. Uh, but it, it, let's compare that to slavery in the U.S. Because when originally when slavery was starting in the United States, they didn't they weren't using African slaves and they were trying to use n- the enslaved Native American population. But that never worked out. Can you can we address the difference between then to the American style slavery and sure. Mexican slavery? Uh, yeah. And it's the differences between American slavery 
and um, Mexican slavery are, are, are really quite profound and quite interesting. Uh, one the the um, uh, one, one of the, the small but extremely important differences is that the, the uh, Diaz did, did not believe in breaking up slave families, and there was there was a reason for it that he felt that if uh, if the if the husband and father was there with his family, he would be less likely to attempt to escape. He would not want to abandon his family, and one of the one of the effects and Diaz had, had, had enslaved well over fifty percent of the population. And so it was these were people that um, the Mexican people came out of profound slavery, and but one of the the, the effects that that had in, in not breaking up the families and keeping them together, that they developed a very profound sense of the nuclear family. But but that that uh, unlike American slavery, where they they had no qualms at all about busting up you know families. Yeah, it was based on that. They didn't based for, on for for very mercy for very mercenary reasons, they didn't break the families up. But the um, uh, the American slavery was really bad, and but where it really turned bad was in around 1840. The English perfected the steam the steam driven spinning mill, and practically overnight, that they could sell unlimited uh, uh, quantities of cotton for uh, for a lot of money. And at one point, it became cotton became so valuable that the um, and of course when the, the American South, particularly the Deep South. Had a had a global monopoly on cotton production, and so that the the only thing standing between them and unlimited profits were you know they, had, they were having a sufficient number of slaves, so they began buying up every slave they could get their hands on. That's where the expression "sell them down the river" came from. Mm-hmm. You know that they they were that uh, if you had if you were living in in Missouri and you had some slaves, you could sell them for an enormous amount of money in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, whatever. Interesting. And the uh, and and then the, the the abuse of the slaves became horrendous. Yeah. The the, the southern plantation owners had a led, led an extremely profligate lifestyle. They were extremely ostentatious. Throwing always throwing lavish balls that they were degenerate gamblers that they were big horse races big big card games they were betting everything they had the in the in the summers that they were they're afraid of malaria yellow fever and what so they'd take their families to New York City and while they're in New York City they would borrow money from the New York banks and you know what they used for collateral slaves, slaves. they actually yeah. had on the mortgages they had slaves down for you know, collateralizing the loans, and the um, and so they they really began working the uh, the slaves just hideously, and of course the things they feared most of all were slaves had run away, and that's when you know the the abolition movement in the North um, coincidentally started to grow, and the slaves did want to leave; they were being worked to death and horribly and and beaten if they didn't make their quotas, and the uh, but also they they feared slave rebellions. And so it really got got very very bad, and the slavery got it was always bad, but it got really horrible in the deep south for the slaves. 